So the structure is reversed. So it's more like an echo. It's a sound. It's bouncing, it's back. bouncing back. So I push it, keep pushing it forward, and on the fifth painting, it starts to bounce back. To bounce back. It's like a drum or a sound. It's more like a sound in a canyon, like an echo. Like I'm shouting. I am shouting. Visually. And now it's bounced back with a visual that has remnants, which is the scraping of the first. But it's changed on its own, sort of. I mean, it hasn't changed on its own. It has. I mean, it's a conversation that is somewhat out of my control, but my hand is still involved in it. Meaning the scraped part is left for chance and discovery. It's independent. It is hard to see how any artifact other than the washed, nearly blank canvas could better represent the abundance of material that has lived for a time on its surface. And by material, I mean not only the repeated coats of oil paint and gesso, but the series of inspirations from memory, from childhood, from fantasy, from music and sound, actual and metaphorical, from the happenstance of color, that went into the images, along with the struggles of these images to realize themselves, for a balance to be achieved so that a thumbprint might be impressed on the side of the canvas and the image scraped and washed to make way for a new rendering. And also the physical effort expended by the artist in all this conceiving, painting, scraping, and washing. The truth is, even a project far less complex than the one being undertaken by the artist would offer the operator an inexhaustible surplus of a material with which to work. Perhaps even more than the loss of the images themselves, more than the absent chronicle of creative inspiration, more than the history of spent labor, it is the poignancy of the artist's regret at erasing his own creations that grants these canvases their ghostly life. There is more latent in this collaboration with the artist than the operator could ever use, more ideas than he can possibly implement. Well, I stretched my arms out on this canvas. This canvas is bigger than me, which is interesting. I can barely reach the top. I kind of have to jump like that. It's a shame. I guess it's a shame that this gets scraped. It's interesting to see my hand in it as it's stretched, as my arms are stretched. It's like the limits of my own reach. You know, thinking about the Matthew Barney drawing restraint. Always thinking about that. It's a great piece. I like this piece. This is interesting. It's fun to look at for me. If I were to relate this paintings, this series to us, it's humans. We are on top of the foundation. We can be scraped. We grow on top of the foundation and then we are removed. Come back. We're not important. It's not sacred. It's not. The image is compromised. What is the importance of the artist's hand? It's not that important. It's the stain that's left behind. It's not the image, it's the stain. It's just like ruins, right? Well, I guess that's not quite right. The artist has experienced a depth to his painting in this project that may make it difficult to return to its former mode of practice. The operator has been trying as much as possible to keep the attention of these machines on the artist and his art. But this habit of self-abnegation, combined in intention with the sheer quantity of things the operator wants to say, a multitude of ideas that arose out of conversations with the artist, from the artist's voice memos and painting videos, and from the operator's observation of the evolution of the show, particularly its digital aspects. And this desire to say can never be innocent of the knowledge that it is nearly impossible to suggest an approach to the art without the viewer inferring that what they've been given is the approach to the art, and that every assertion demands questioning, if not contradiction, and that truth is contained neither in the assertion nor in the contradiction, though it may be approached occasionally in their pairing, and that only his evasions seem to escape the stench of falsehood. This combination of factors, these tensions, 
have led the operator to a feeling of exhaustion. Not the exhaustion of a project pursued to completion, but of a capacity spent. And so, conscious of this depletion, he offers a dream. A dream he had when still in the full fire of this collaboration. A dream of the wildness of art, of the innate alienness of beauty, of the impossibility of determining whether what one is offering is alive or dead until its encounter with the audience, of the inevitability of failure and of the desire to continue regardless. A show I put on with Joseph. Um, we, we like, it's, it's like a circus sideshow kind of thing. There's no like fun to it, but it has that kind of slapdash feel. And we have cats and also sea creatures. Sea creatures have all these different like shells or glass shapes. We store them together and a lot of them die or are dead. Or we don't know. But you can't really be sure. Like you think some are dead, they're not moving around. And all of a sudden they start moving around. Things are always escaping. It's always chaos. I've, I've either had the dream multiple times or in this dream we did it multiple times. But it really has that depth of having done it multiple times. And this terrible feeling about it. Like we can't take care of all these things. We're just trying to hold on and show them. So I was wrong. It has disintegrated, but the structure is coming back. After it's been scraped, the structure starts to reform again. It never disintegrates completely. It's always present. It just becomes harder to see. Joseph's part of the show has like a little like there he was doing a thing where he was it was this didn't seem to involve any live things or very few. And he had a he had some kind of device that could read and speak what it read. And he maybe it was a coral or something, you know, like the living part. I don't know, but it was beautiful. He, he had this like tool and he kind of cleaned or swept or something with one hand, you know, like a broom or a little, you know, whatever broom. And with the other hand, he was holding the thing, like a magnifying glass, but not, not really. And it would speak out the words that came out underneath. And that was really beautiful. I can't remember any of the words, though. I just finished um, doing some painting on canvas number five. And all I got to say is that I'm sitting here looking at the overall content of this entire project. And there is no turning back. I can't imagine going back to painting the way I used to. Or even doing art the way I used to. The progression is amazing. And it's like fast forwarding time is really what it is. One canvas is erased over and over again. I mean, you know, you look at de Kooning and Pollock, Basquiat, you know, all of the greats, right? I mean... Jesus, just fucking bullshit, canvas by canvas, and the bullshit of just looking at it and hesitating, there is no more hesitation. The technology has caught up to us. We don't need to sit there and make an individual canvas. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, the artist's hand and all that bullshit, but no one fucking cares. They really don't. And you shouldn't. I'm not sure you should. I'm not sure that part of it is important. It's the image. It's totally liberating by being able to just move. The human condition needs to 
be free to be able to really, really expand and explore and discover. And that's what this project does. It liberates. I don't know what painting this is. It's the fifth canvas, but this is the bounce back. This is the echo. Go. I guess that's when I'm referring to it, but this time, this time it's in its full glory. It's just hanging out, saying hi. It's big. And it never goes away. It's always there just hidden. You just can't see it. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. My punishment was just fucking chaos. Yeah, cats and, cats and like crabs or whatever. The cats were like always oh, big, this big furry ball. You pull a bunch out, separate them, and some of them see if they start moving. But I barely remember the show. It was just like, shut <laughs> Put them out, see what happens, see what moves. Lose some, try not to lose any. Check it quick. Rudy out when they when they got lost. And Joseph was so angry at the end. He was like ripping off his suit that he was wearing. Because I don't know, because it didn't work again. But I kept doing it. And it seemed like he wanted to quit and I was like I don't want him to quit. 